July 18, 2014. The calm and peaceful tranquility of the day has just been disrupted by the squawk of a panicked report over the radio. Civilians in danger, urgent assistance required. The park ranger hears the screams carried through the trees by the wind a second later, already hurtling his way toward the location given by his colleague. Something is very, very wrong. Usually nothing like this happens at Crater Lake National Park. His mind starts racing as fast as the jeep he's driving, a brain entering survival mode, trying to predict every possible danger. A forest fire? It was still daylight, he'd have seen the smoke. An animal attack? Maybe, bears could sometimes be seen roaming about on the fringes of the park, but they typically kept away from humans, especially the more people were around. And today, in the midst of July, there were plenty to ward off any strays. Every attempted prediction only raised the same question. Just what the hell was going on? Approaching the tree line, one of the other rangers waves down the car. She's armed. If the vagueness of the report hadn't been troubling enough, seeing another park ranger with a shotgun in her hands certainly was. They were in bear territory. It wasn't unheard of for one of them to occasionally need a gun to ward the bears off, but that was a rarity out at Crater Lake. Slamming the brakes and leaping out of the jeep, the park ranger rushes towards his colleague as she takes cover behind a nearby tree. He immediately asks her what the situation is, but she urges him to be quiet. There's something out there with them, she tells him in a whisper, racking a live round into her shotgun. When the park ranger asks what, the other ranger shoots him a look. Her eyes say it all. She's terrified and confused. This isn't just a wild animal on a rampage or frightenedly defending its territory and cubs. She has no idea what it is. She can't even believe she's seen it, let alone start describing it. Twigs snap under the foot of… something, causing the other ranger to raise her shotgun, leaning out from behind the tree in the direction of the noise. She scans the space a few feet beyond the barrel. Nothing. The park ranger takes a look for himself, not exactly eager to see what it is, but unable to fend off his own curiosity. He spots something, nothing more than a shape passing between the trees, almost mistaking it for a branch simply moving in the gentle breeze. He taps on the other ranger's shoulder and alerts her. Whatever it is, it's close, and it seems to be walking like a man. The other ranger looks. In a second, she raises her shotgun and fires. A blast of buckshot erupts from the barrel, causing a deafening, high-pitched ringing in the park ranger's ears. He doubles over, clutching his ears as the sound becomes physically painful, not realizing his colleague fumbling as she grabs a fresh cartridge, or the thing staggering towards them. That is, until he looks up. The moment his hearing returns. But before we go any further, I have a question for you. Does something feel wrong with you? Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who's going through a hard time, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible, and this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Bob. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost, without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Bob. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. Now back to the bizarre creature in the forest. It's like part of the forest has come to life and assumed the shape of a human being in order to attack them. Roots cover its body, sealing up the space where its eyes would be. Oregon-beaked moss coats its arms and hangs off it like it's been draped in a sheet of yellowy-green plants. The creature is horrible to look at, and yet it looks lost. It stumbles, arms outstretched like it's trying to blindly feel its way around, and the park ranger realizes it can't see. 
Another cartridge clicks into the shotgun tube, pulled back the chamber by the slide of the pump, and the other ranger raises the weapon, steadying her aim so as not to miss this time. Her sights line up, the mossy monstrosity sitting in the center, and her fingers squeezes on the trigger. An unexpected force from below pushes the barrel of the shotgun upwards, pointing it towards the treetops. Another ear-splitting blast rings out, sending nearby birds flying from their nests in panic. The park ranger keeps the weapon pointed up, despite his colleague's protests to let go of her gun or the drops of blood dripping out and trailing down his neck from his own eardrums. He glances over his shoulder as, whatever it is, flees in terror. Startled by the shotgun blast, it runs away between the trees, knocking into some as it moves with uncertainty. Minutes later, a team of other rangers arrives, declaring that they're taking over the search effort for the creature that was found lurking around Crater Lake National Park. These rangers seem… off. They look the part, in full uniforms and everything, but the park ranger can't place their faces. They somehow seem brand new, yet not one of them is phased by the unusual situation. They seemed all the more interested in questioning all the hikers and families visiting the park who had seen the creature, as they were in actually finding it. It was almost as if they didn't want the word getting out. The park ranger decides he can't keep quiet any longer and raises a concern to the newcomers. He tells them that he doesn't think whatever is out there is some kind of monster. He thinks it's human. The new rangers thank him for his input, but insist that they'll take it from here. Little did he know, these weren't other park rangers. They were agents of the SCP Foundation. They have been embedded within the National Park's rangers to contain SCP-3310, an anomalous log floating in Crater Lake, said to contain a powerful deity named Yao, who can cause dangerous weather to erupt unless the log is left to float freely. Then the call comes in from SCP Foundation Command, reports of an entity attacking civilians. Since they happen to be nearby, in the same park no less, a handful of agents are sent in to investigate and, if possible, contain the creature. Before too long, the civilian witnesses, even the real park rangers who had tried to kill the entity, have all been interviewed, administered with memory-wiping amnestics, and subsequently released, as if nothing out of the ordinary has even happened. Putting boots to the ground, the search for the unidentified creature doesn't last long. Within two hours, the agents have found what they're looking for. Only, it's not a creature. It's a person. His name is Zach Herman. They find him cowering under an alcove near the edge of the lake, his moss-covered skin providing a near-perfect camouflage for him to blend in with his woodland surroundings. The only thing that gives him away is the sound of his frightened sobs. The Foundation agents aren't under orders to neutralize him on sight. Instead, they humanely subdue Zach Herman and arrange to have him taken to a nearby Foundation outpost for examination. SCP-3462, an anomalous humanoid entity known to inhabit a rundown blockbuster video rental store in the nearby town of Bend, Oregon, with the area having been sealed off and constantly patrolled by Foundation personnel. So that seems like the best place to take Zack and figure out exactly what happened to him. Upon closer examination at the Foundation outpost, it's discovered that Zack Herman has a number of unidentified roots growing through both his skin and internal organs. Given the danger to his life that this poses, he's rushed into an operating theater to undergo emergency surgery. Eighteen hours pass as the Foundation tries to save the man's life. At this time, the surgeons decide that it isn't wise or possible to remove all the roots at once, so instead, they focus on clearing the ones that had grown within and over his eyes, nostrils, ear canals, and throat. Another seven hours of intensive surgery pass, and Zach Herman is still alive. He's not cured, but the roots covering much of his face have at least been cleared. After stabilizing, it's then that he's transferred to Site 56, where the Foundation intends to conduct further operations to remove the growths from his body, as well as ask Zack questions about what happened to him. They're still baffled as to what caused his anomalous mutation into a moss monster. Just where had these roots come from? And what exactly was SCP-7185? Researcher Charlie Canley is tasked with conducting interviews with the subject, Zach Herman, between his various procedures, and she wastes no time in unearthing his story. Oak Ridge, Oregon, 60 miles north of Crater Lake National Park, where Zach will eventually be found. That's where he describes the horrific mutation taking place. Given that the roots would grow over his eyes, his vision impaired, he has no idea where he's going, 
until he eventually winds up in Crater Lake. Scared, alone, and changed beyond recognition. And as he describes it, he wasn't the only one. Shortly before his own mutation, Zack mentions witnessing the same happening to Kellen Herman, his husband. The couple, along with a group of several others, are in a small Oregon town reached by traveling to Hills Creek Lake, then following Hills Creek Road south until finding a road sign simply labeled Beard. The place has spent 70 years in ruins, abandoned, and left to be overtaken by the elements. Most of the roads leading into the area are blocked off thanks to a landslide, leaving the town completely void of all human life. Until Zack and his friends arrive in Beard. There are six of them in total, including Zack, his husband Kellen, then Azrael, Mark, Angel, and Caleb. Answering an ad on Craigslist, the group has come to Beard after being hired by a man named Sean to scavenge through the abandoned town, collecting anything that could potentially be of value. Scrap metal and intact valuables, as long as they can be resold, are worth holding on to. While the group searches, Sean delivers food and supplies to them once per month. One thing that they hope for each time, but never seem to get, is something to drink in their downtime. So on a whim, while exploring an abandoned factory they come across, Zack looks for an alternative source of beer for the group to enjoy. What he finds is an unusual blue machine. Pulling levers on it, he finds that it dispenses samples of a surprisingly green liquid. Of course, none of the group immediately drinks it. Not until Angel finds an old journal with entries dating back to the 1930s. It describes the owners of the factory giving the liquid to their workers and only ceasing the practice after the workers stopped getting drunk. Taking that to mean the liquid was safe to drink, the group decided to each take a swig of the green. Initially, none of them feel any change. It's actually rather anticlimactic, at least at first. Soon after, however, they start to feel energized, more alert and awake for much longer without feeling the usually expected fatigue that would bring. It even helps them search through parts of the town quicker, something they're all grateful for. After a week, not one of them even feels the need to sleep. They were even healing from injuries faster, small cuts were sealing in minutes, bruises clearing entirely almost as quickly as they formed. After about a month, the negative side effects start. They start manifesting as small symptoms, the group experiencing various bodily aches that gradually become far, far worse. It affects each of them differently too. Zack starts to experience a tightness in his chest, while Caleb develops a bad fever that leaves him barely able to function. Mark and Angel's hair starts falling out in thick clumps too. Soon after, the same is happening to Caleb. His symptoms are the first to worsen. After his hair falls out, his skin starts to do the same. It keeps peeling away, turning red. Then Sean arrives in Beard. According to the information given by Zack in his interviews with the Foundation, their employer would routinely drive to the town every three months in order to pick up anything valuable the group has recovered. All of them suffering from the ill effects of whatever the liquid they'd all drank was, those of the group that still had the strength to stand rushed to meet Sean and beg him to get them help. Upon taking one look at them, he drives away, abandoning them. Four days after Sean left them there, the sleepless group is startled by screaming in the night. It's Caleb, and he's on fire. Panicking, the others try to help, pouring water on him to douse the flames. It seems to work but it's only a few minutes before the fire starts up again. They even try taking him to the creek that runs through the town, but submerging Caleb in the water only causes his skin to form massive blisters that painfully burst. Keeping him under didn't work either. He kept needing to come up for air, and breaking the surface, he started catching fire again the second he was above water. There was nothing they could do to save him. He just kept burning. Caleb is the first of the group to die. It's not clear when this occurred, Investigating the area, the Foundation recovers fragmented journal entries written by Azrael, in which the others all attribute Caleb's death to him having a weak immune system. But normally, diseases don't cause people to spontaneously catch fire. By the morning, he is almost completely burned, leaving only a charred corpse that the group buries by the factory. Following Caleb's death, Zack is forced to leave. The others blame him for Caleb's death, and he does as well. He intends to find some other way of getting help for the rest of the group. Kellen joins him, and the couple leave Beard together. Meanwhile, Angel, Mark, and Azrael search for their own way out of the town, but to no avail. Hardly any of the roads are accessible on foot, and those that are 
just lead to abandoned properties on the woodland outskirts of Beard. According to Azrael's journal entry, they then refocused their efforts towards finding a cure for whatever it was they had drunk. It's not much more successful. During Zack and Kellen's absence, Mark is the next group member whose symptoms start to get worse. His hair was almost entirely gone, and soon, rashes started to form over his skin before peeling away. Immediately, he and the other two start to fear that what happened to Caleb might be about to happen to Mark, too. Their only plan is for Mark to stay out in the snow if he starts catching fire in the same way, since, by this point, winter had reached Oregon. But instead of a reoccurrence of Caleb's condition, Mark's skin begins repeatedly forming an unusual bluish-green substance, warm to the touch. It accumulates every few hours, and Angel and Azrael help him scrape it off before it ultimately returns. Within days, it's returning faster, too fast for them to clear it. So much of it forms that it starts dripping off Mark. Then Angel points out it seems to be candle wax, and the more of it, the hotter it gets. Shortly after, the substance burns out Mark's eyes. He's completely covered in scalding hot wax, with no way of removing it entirely. Eventually, he dies. Angel and Azrael can't move his body thanks to the wax, as more of it keeps forming, nor can they bury him yet thanks to a snowstorm outside. It's only a week later that Azrael thinks he sees the body moving. Mark is still alive. He's been lying in a pile of hot wax the entire time, his body still making more. Soon, he stops moving altogether. While all this is happening, Kellen and Zack are still trying to find help, but manage to wind up lost in the woods surrounding Beard. The numerous overlapping and confusing paths surrounding the town had meant one wrong turn since both of them heading towards the woods with only a few cans of food, a lighter, and a pocket knife between them. After a week, they pass a mountain that Zack assumes is the Diamond Peak Volcano. Another week later, both he and Kellen are beginning to suffer their own severe symptoms from the liquid they consume. Kellen is vomiting shards of metal and glass. Further metallic chunks were breaking through Kellen's skin as they grew within his body. At the same time, Roots grow over Zack's eyes, preventing him from fully seeing just what is happening to his husband. They sit together in Kellen's dying moments, Zack feeling like he needs to be there for his partner, even though he can't see him or do anything to help him. A few hours after Kellen's breathing eventually stops, Zack walks through the woods until he hears the sound of cars, only to be found in Crater Lake National Park. Around the same time, Angel also dies. It takes him a whole week after his eyelids and fingernails fall out, followed by every layer of his skin. It would happen multiple times, thanks to the effects of the green liquid causing him to recover, Also, his skin could once again come off. At one point, Azrael, horrified by it all, sees his friend's face fall off. Still unable to find a way out of Beard, one of the remaining two survivors of the group also starts to change. Bumps form under Azrael's skin eventually causing his hands to become swollen and preventing him from moving anything below his chest. Aware of his impending fate, he stashes the journal he's been writing in inside a backpack and leaves it for whoever finds them. The Foundation is able to recover the bodies of Azrael, Angel, Mark, and the buried remains of Caleb within Beard, but they decline to share this information with Zack. Sean's identity is confirmed to be that of Sean McDougall, and Foundation agents are sent to interrogate him. They aren't able to ascertain any valuable information from him, so instead, amnesticize him. Anything saved on Sean's devices relating to the location of the town of Beard, the group he hired to scavenge there, and the $46,000 he'd made from the scavenged goods are all seized. SCP-7185 consists of two elements. The first is an unidentified machine that was uncovered by Zach Herman and his friends in an abandoned factory in the southern Cascadian mountain range of Oregon. Despite not having any power sources connected to it, SCP-7185 seemingly functions without the need for electricity. It is instead operated via a series of levers connected to the main body of the device. Two are black and one is rusted over. Should both of the black levers be switched downwards and the rusty lever pulled, the machine will produce the second element of this anomaly, designated by the Foundation as SCP-7185-1, hereby alternatively known as the body horror juice. The alcoholic liquid byproduct of activating SCP-7185 is green in color and has a semi-viscous consistency. If this liquid is drunk at any point by a human being, 
then this person will undergo major bodily changes that tend to span a period of at least several weeks. Anyone ingesting SCP-7185-1 will suffer numerous mutations and deformations of their body, although exactly how they are altered varies depending on the person drinking the juice. SCP-7185-1 also negates the effects of any depressants, opiates, or other stimulants taken after ingestion, meaning there is no way to nullify the pain of these intense physical changes. On July 21, 2014, Zach Herman died due to complications during surgery. The Foundation surgeons had been making extensive efforts to clear the roots growing throughout his body as a result of Herman ingesting SCP-7185. They had made enough of a difference to allow him to participate in interviews with researcher Canley. However, during these exchanges, Zach mentions that he can still feel everything that is happening to him during the procedures. Every incision, every removal, every stitch. The same day, the body of Zach's husband, Kellen Herman, is also recovered. Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me, it can't be that bad, reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible, and as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. They have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around, but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you, and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you, and turn again. Hello? Is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond, and you scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt, and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you, and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. You take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park. The detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks, 
slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred milky white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which you can see is completely covered in a hard white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away. He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910, but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910, and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially, or perhaps entirely, out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victims' mouths. Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability causing them to act as a vector for the effect, who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary, though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. Unfortunately for the victim, should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings, and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary, due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. Watch this, the teenage boy says before jumping his skateboard up onto the stair railing. His friends watch in amazement as he deftly guides his board down the long rail. They hoot and holler in support, until suddenly, the boy seems to lose his balance. He falls from the rail and tumbles down the stairs of the large parking garage where they had been practicing their skateboarding tricks. The boy hits the ground at the end of the stairs, and all of his friends go quiet. The boy is stunned, but eventually he opens his eyes and stands up, but none of his friends can do anything except stare. Oh no, oh no, oh no, 
the boy says as he looks down at his arm, which is now bent at a 90-degree angle in a spot where no joint should exist. The children watching all begin to scream, and one, unsure of what else to do, turns and runs. What do I do? What do I do? The boy with the broken arm says to no one and everyone. Luckily, one of the group quickly collects herself and steps forward to take control of the situation. Come on, she says, we're getting you to the hospital. The girl puts her arm around him on his non-damaged side and helps him to the street, where they have a stroke of good luck. Parked just a block away is an ambulance. Hey, the girl cries out, waving towards the ambulance. The paramedics inside must have seen her, because the ambulance's lights immediately come on and it drives the short distance to them. The ambulance stops, and two paramedics quickly exit the vehicle. The paramedics don't even need to ask what happened. They can obviously see from the unnatural angle of the boy's arm that he needs immediate medical attention, and they quickly place him into the back of the ambulance. The girl begins to pull herself into the back as well, but is quite forcefully shoved back into the street. Patients only, is the sole response from the paramedic who pushed her before he slams the door shut. The girl gets a brief look at her friend's frightened face through the back window as the ambulance speeds away. Several days later, the children are sitting outside of the same parking structure, but none of them are in any mood to skate. All they can think about is their missing friend. Neither the boy's parents nor the police have any idea what happened to him or where he went. There's no records at any of the local hospitals of him ever being brought there, nor does there seem to be any evidence of this particular ambulance having existed at all. No one even seems to believe the children that he got into an ambulance. The whole story just seems too far-fetched and outlandish but the children know what they saw. As they discuss the events for the hundredth or perhaps thousandth time, one of the smallest of the group suddenly stands up and points. There it is! The rest of the group looks in the direction he's motioning and sees the same thing. It's the ambulance. None of them know what to do as the vehicle flies past them, this time with no lights on, and comes to a stop a block away from where they first spotted it. They watch as the two paramedics exit the vehicle and go around to the back. It's hard to see from this distance, but it looks as though they took something out of the rear of the ambulance, something that requires both of them to lift, before dropping it on the sidewalk behind some trash cans. The children watch as the paramedics get back into the ambulance and drive away, disappearing just as quickly as they appeared. After a moment of shock, they all in unison begin running to the place where the ambulance stopped. They come to a skidding halt just in front of the trash cans. None of them can do anything except stare until they all break out into screams, one of the children turning and immediately running away. And they have good reason to scream, because in front of them is their friend. His arm is no longer broken, appearing to have been somehow repaired in just a matter of days, but it is also no longer attached to his shoulder. The boy opens his eyes as his friends scream, and looks down to see that his arms and legs have been reattached at a new angle, jutting out from his back, leaving him standing on all fours, his face staring up at the sky like some kind of twisted animal. What happened to this young man was tragic, but he wasn't the first victim of this strange malicious anomaly, and unfortunately, neither would he be the last, because this was SCP-4419, also known as the Butcher's Chariot. SCP-4419 appears to be a seemingly normal vehicle which resembles a standard ambulance, though the exact make and model varies between manifestations. This anomalous ambulance will appear spontaneously in locations where a medical emergency of some kind is about to take place. Just how SCP-4419 is able to predict where and when these events will take place is unknown, nor is it understood how it always takes the form of an ambulance that resembles one appropriate to the local area. Once the medical event has occurred, whether that be a minor injury like a sprain or something more serious, such as a gunshot wound, SCP-4419 will quickly approach the injured individual. Two individuals which have a humanoid appearance and are dressed in paramedic uniforms that are, just like the ambulance, always appropriate to the location, will exit the ambulance. They will then secure the victim, using a stretcher if need be, and place them in the back of the ambulance. While the individuals who emerge from SCP-4419 will, for the most part, act as though they are normal medical professionals, they will strongly resist any attempt to either impede them in their quest to secure the injured person, as well as prevent anyone else except for their target from getting into the back of the SCP-4419 ambulance, up to and including the use of extreme physical force. As soon as the paramedic appearing individuals have managed to secure the victim in the back of the ambulance, it will then quickly leave the area at a high rate of speed, and research has shown that as soon as it is out of observation, SCP-4419 will demanifest, along with whoever is inside. 
But this isn't the end of what this anomaly has in store for its victim. Between two and seven days later, the SCP-4419 ambulance will suddenly reappear at the same area where it picked up its victim. The same individuals will exit the ambulance and leave the victim somewhere nearby before getting back in the vehicle and leaving the scene once again. The victim who is left behind will always have suffered what can only be described as invasive bodily modifications. Their injuries are so extreme that in most cases they should have resulted in the death of the victim, and yet they will always somehow still be alive. While the exact form of modification will vary from victim to victim, there does appear to be some correlation between the original medical emergency and the resulting procedure. And the SCP Foundation has documented a number of encounters with SCP-4419 stretching all the way back to the early 1980s. Some notable examples include one from 1983, in which a pedestrian who was crossing the street was struck by an automobile, resulting in them breaking their leg. SCP-4419 was on site and quickly helped the man into the back of the ambulance. When he was returned several days later, all of his limbs had been reattached in such a way that they were protruding from the front of his torso. In another event which occurred in 1994, a man suffered a broken jaw in a fight outside of a bar. To no surprise, SCP-4419 was on hand and took the man away for treatment. When he was next seen, his jaw had been permanently forced open, and a glass window had been installed in the back of his throat, which permitted direct viewing of his heart, which had also been moved to the back of the throat. Unfortunately, there was no way to reverse this procedure, and the man had to be euthanized. In 2003, a husband and wife were in a car accident where they each sustained multiple broken bones. When SCP-4419 dropped them back off, the two had been fused together at the back, and any bones that were broken in the crash had been removed completely. When an elderly gentleman had a heart attack in 2006, he was picked up by SCP-4419 and returned with 11 new, non-functioning hearts grafted inside of his body. Attempts were made to remove these additional hearts through surgery, but unfortunately, the man did not survive the procedure. In 2008, a structure fire resulted in 19 people suffering extreme burns. Seven more injuries came when a crowd attempted to stop the SCP-4419 paramedics from placing all of the victims in the back of the ambulance, but they were unsuccessful in preventing them from leaving the scene with them. When the group of victims was finally returned, it was as a single organism, a large, solitary mass which twitches and shivers when physical contact is applied. No method for euthanizing this organism has been able to be found and currently they are stored inside of a tank at Site-31. In perhaps the strangest sighting of SCP-4419, a US private was wounded while on patrol in Afghanistan, and a military medical evacuation vehicle arrived to evacuate him. Suspicious about the vehicle's sudden appearance and the forceful conduct of the medical staff, the private's fellow soldiers ended up opening fire on the vehicle. They reported seeing a viscous black fluid leaking from the vehicle's surface, but they were unable to stop it from taking the injured private. In a deviation from its normal behavior, the victim was not returned to the same place, and instead appeared in the barracks the next day. The victim had been broken down into a thin paste and was spread across the walls. Agents were dispatched to secure what was left of the man, and they reported finding a still intact eyeball that dilated when they approached. The collected viscera has been labeled as remains and placed in storage, but it is currently unknown whether or not the victim has truly expired. Due to the danger SCP-4419 presents to anyone who suffers an injury, as well as its ability to appear virtually anywhere on the planet, it has been classified as Keter. Containment efforts at this point are largely focused on maintaining information control and post-manifestation cleanup, as opposed to any attempts at physical confinement. Anyone who witnesses an SCP-4419 manifestation is to be administered amnestics, and victims are to be treated in order to restore them to their original physical state as much as possible, or euthanized when no viable medical treatments are available, with a cover story constructed in order to explain their death. SCP-4419 is one of the most cruel and sadistic anomalies in the SCP Foundation's database, ranking right up there with SCP-106, The Old Man. Hopefully one day we will find a means to contain this brutal so-called medical vehicle, but until then, be careful if you suffer an injury and an ambulance is suddenly on hand, you might come back changed in ways you never thought possible. It's Saturday night, and a teenaged boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall, with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, 
and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone. But they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's them, a pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them. They look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as my face that I may be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below them all, deep underground, something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site-81715 an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81-715. These instances are considered hostile, and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed, and what exactly the pit is, are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715-A instances exist down in the pit. 
with the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces. SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities, after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. The Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter, and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B, who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715-B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher Doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher Doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B, and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715 the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. 
do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit, and what will they do should they ever get out? As you can clearly see, this completely throws our entire understanding of our place in the universe into complete disarray says the astronomer as he excitedly makes his case to a panel of aged and supposedly learned advisors. My observations leave no doubt that everything we previously suspected to be the absolute truth is wrong. The panel of advisors murmur and lean close together to whisper to each other. The astronomer can't hear what they are saying, but the passion and joy that he felt as he explained his findings to the room is quickly draining from his face. He can see the men mouthing the words, no, and lies, as they make disapproving gestures. But how could this be? Had they not understood what he was showing them? Maybe he didn't explain things in a way that they could comprehend. Here he was, the greatest scientist of his day, presenting hard facts, backed up by rigorous observations, and this was their reaction. The group of advisors finish conferring and grow quiet. The chief advisor clears his throat and everyone in the room waits for him to speak. Royal scientist, this panel has examined your findings and listened to your theories. The advisor can't help but sneer at the word, and has decided that the ideas you present are not only incorrect, but dangerous. The astronomer can't believe what he's hearing. This panel, acting under the authority of the king, has charged you with the crime of heresy. The astronomer is shocked. He steps towards the panel to plead with them, but he's stopped by a pair of guards who grab him by the arms. Stop! Stop! I'm a man of science! I only presented you with the truth! But no one seems moved by his appeals. The panel watches as the astronomer is dragged from the room, kicking and fighting, still insisting on his innocence. The screams echo through the dungeon as the torturer cranks another notch on the rack, stretching the astronomer's body just a little bit more. He has no idea how long this has been going on. Hours? Days? The pain has been excruciating and without end. He closes his eyes, trying to escape the torture by retreating into his mind, but he's slapped on the face and brought back to the reality of his situation. Standing in front of him is the chief advisor, the same one who sentenced him to this inhumane treatment. You can end this any time you like. Simply recant your statements and admit you were mistaken and all of this will be over. The astronomer is unsure if by over he means that they will release him or simply kill him to put him out of his misery. But it didn't matter which the right answer was, he couldn't lie. The astronomer knew the truth, and no amount of pain, no matter how intense or how long they submitted him to it, would change what he now knew. Disappointed with the astronomer's steadfastness, the advisor signals to the torturer, who cranks the rack again, stretching the astronomer's body to the point where he feels like his bones might pop out of their sockets. Recant, the advisor screams, repeating the word over and over, growing louder as the astronomer's own cries increase from the pain caused by the torturer cranking the rack more and more. The astronomer closes his eyes again. He's certain this will be the end of him soon, and that he will die with the great secret he's learned without getting the chance to share it with the world. But suddenly, the astronomer notices that the room has gone quiet, the advisor is no longer yelling, and the torturer has stopped operating the machine. The astronomer opens his eyes to see the advisor and the torturer both in a deep bow. His gaze continues up and he sees the king himself standing in front of him. The king stares at the astronomer for what feels like an eternity before simply asking, is it true? The astronomer, limbs still stretched on the rack, manages a nod, and with his remaining strength whispers, It's true. The king motions with his hand to the torturer, who stands up and begins releasing the astronomer from his constraints. The advisor protests, But my lord, this man… But he's cut off by the king with a stern look, and retreats back into his deep bow. Show me, the king says, as the astronomer stands rubbing his sore shoulders where the tendons and muscles were stretched far beyond their natural limits. The astronomer opens the door to his laboratory and gestures for the king to enter. The room is a mess of papers and scientific equipment, a reflection of the busy and scattered mind of the man who works here. 
The king is immediately drawn to a table with a large scroll. He spreads it across the table and examines it, but his face betrays no hint of what he is thinking. Is this what you showed my advisors? The astronomer nods yes. Would you like to see for yourself? The astronomer motions to the window, where a brass tube is attached to a tripod. The king approaches the device, but doesn't know how it works. The astronomer demonstrates by looking through the eyepiece. He moves it slightly, making small adjustments to make sure it is just right for the king. There, now look. The king bends over to peer through the telescope, and a look of shock comes over his face. What he sees is the most incredible thing he has ever witnessed. There, far above up in the sky, unable to be seen by the naked eye, is a man, and he is staring back at him. The planet that this played out on was not Earth, but a bizarre place that is one of the strangest anomalies in the entire SCP Foundation archive. This is SCP-007, also known as Abdominal Planet. SCP-007 is a spherical object located in the abdomen of a young man, or rather, in the space where his abdomen should be, since most of the muscle, skin, and organs that should be present simply are not. The subject, a Caucasian male in his mid-twenties of average height and build, does not appear affected by the large missing portion of his body, and has not reported experiencing pain or discomfort of any kind. In the space where his abdominal muscles and organs should be is a small globe composed of soil and water. This sphere, which measures roughly 60 centimeters in diameter, resembles the planet Earth, though the arrangement of the continents does not match any known configuration from our own planet's history. The tiny planet has its own weather patterns, and even a small, but still detectable, gravitational pull. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of SCP-007 is that it appears to be inhabited. Microscopic organisms that would correspond to roughly the scale of human beings on Earth have been observed on the surface of the planet. So far, two distinct intelligent species have been identified, both of whom seem to possess a technological level similar to the 15th century on Earth. It is unknown if the inhabitants of the abdominal planet are aware of the world outside of their planet, and communication attempts with the planet's occupants have been placed on hold by senior Foundation officials, pending further study into what effect an exchange may have on them or us. The human subject within which SCP-007 is located provided the Foundation with a name that he claims to be his, but no records of such a person existing have yet to be located. Upon being questioned about the lack of records, he willfully offered both a social security and driver's license number, but when they were checked against current records, neither had yet to be assigned by the US government. And the mysteries surrounding this man don't stop there. The subject has not shown the need for either food or water, and it is unknown what energy source his body continues to operate on without nutrition. He is capable of both eating and drinking though, despite the large missing section of his stomach, but it is still not known what happens to the substances after he swallows them. The man has above-average intelligence, and scored a 128 on an administered IQ test. He also generally appears friendly and amiable, and expresses only a passing curiosity about the planet located within his abdomen and how it came to be there. When asked about the origins of the planet, he replied very matter-of-factly that, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Due to the poorly understood nature of SCP-007, it has been classified as Euclid and the small planet and the man it resides in are contained in a sealed, comfortably furnished 10 by 10 meter room that the subject is not allowed to leave. The subject is to be monitored closely by Foundation staff and has a weekly chess game with one of the attending doctors, which also serves as an opportunity to evaluate his mental health. So far, he has not shown any signs of mental illness or violent tendencies and seems to be quite content. In general, he appears happy with his restricted living situation inside the Foundation facility and has made no attempts to escape. The subject has made multiple requests for access to a computer with an internet connection, but due to potential security risks, this request has thus far been denied. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, 
His loyal dog, Mary Bell, is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Mary Bell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Mary Bell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Jorge. And in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's... No. Don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. 
Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. 
With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Marybelle was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. It can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybell is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Marybell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually. But she's been eating just fine. 
It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Maribel whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Maribel down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe. Mary Bell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. 
Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. A kindly-looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall, and a tile slides down off her roof, crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. He just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, he'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed, and plaster is falling on her. What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seemed to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman, after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents. 
and there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor, only it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Temby, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12 and a half meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, the majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local school children singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal. And that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, 
All 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too. And as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers, they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity, but it didn't react, and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant white birch tree, and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town, firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site, 
since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care, and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck. There was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters. But eventually, the resistance became too much. D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembe in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembe Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site-5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr, the room is cold from the wind, but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go, good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it, and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does, though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go, no blankets, just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. She picks it up and examines the cute animal print, remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. 
Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch, or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you'd like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend, though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels, and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms, and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time, and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation, and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. 
Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter feeding state though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment, and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. 
There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with the telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. <laughs> it's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking, but somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange, too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch, and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school, when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now, he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody, and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him.
His hair and fingernails keep growing, to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow, until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin, but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? They might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. 
The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in Stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate but a 21% fatality rate. From Phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2 but will not stop it entirely. In Stage 2, beginning one to two weeks after Stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in Stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in Stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In Stage 3, beginning three to six weeks after Stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now-trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In Stage 5, beginning one to two days after Stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into Stage 6. Little information about Stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at Stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. 
On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. A doctor frantically writes in his journal, It's almost impossible to believe everything that's transpired has taken place in such a short amount of time. It all began three days ago. It was just another day down in the mines. A worker was drilling into a seam of coal when suddenly there was an issue with the rig. From what I've gathered, it sounds like the drill bit exploded due to some kind of mechanical defect, sending shards of metal flying throughout the tunnel. The worker was lucky that none of the large pieces struck him, as they surely would have been fatal. He had, though, still been grazed by a piece of shrapnel from the ruined drill bit, and it had left a deep cut across his upper arm. Other miners who were working nearby heard the commotion and quickly came to his aid. They applied a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood and helped him to the mineshaft elevator for the long ride to the surface. Once they reached the safety of daylight, they brought the injured man to the on-site medical clinic where I was on duty at the time. I cleaned the wound since there was a substantial amount of coal dust that had gotten inside before suturing and bandaging it. The miner was sent to his bunkhouse to recover, and I thought that would be the end of it. Of course, it was only the beginning. Roughly 24 hours later, the same miner presented himself to me once again. I asked about his injury, and he explained that while his arm was fine, he now felt like he might be coming down with an illness. His symptoms included a runny nose, a cough, and body aches, so my assumption was that he'd simply had some bad luck and caught a cold that just so happened to coincide with being injured on the job. I sent him to his bunk once again, telling him that he wouldn't be able to work and should instead use the day to rest and recover. The next day, I was once again in the clinic when my phone rang. It wasn't the sick miner, but instead his supervisor. The miner hadn't shown up for his shift that morning, and he asked for me to go check on him since he knew he hadn't been feeling well. I agreed that it was strange that neither of us had heard anything else from the miner and went to see him straight away. I entered the bunkhouse where many of the workers stay while on site at this remote mine. It was empty, except for the injured miner who was still in his bed. As I approached, I could immediately tell something was very wrong. The man was curled up in the fetal position, and was sweating profusely while also shivering. A quick touch of his forehead revealed that the man had a high fever, too. He was practically incoherent, seemingly delirious from his high temperature. The miner was moved to the empty bed inside the clinic so I could better observe and tend to him, but very carefully since I assumed now that he was actually suffering from influenza and didn't want to risk an outbreak at the mine. I was getting ready to administer fluids to the miner, who was still mumbling incomprehensibly, when I noticed something on his face. It appeared that he was crying, but the tears that ran down his cheeks weren't made of water. They were blood. I hadn't seen anything like it before. There was no reason why influenza should be causing this man to cry tears of blood. I could see the veins in his forehead starting to pulse, as if his blood pressure had suddenly skyrocketed. And just as I was leaning in to get a closer look, something horrible happened. The miner suddenly opened his mouth and expelled an enormous stream of blood. The blast of blood struck me in the face and knocked me backwards in fright, as the man continued expelling more and more blood from his mouth, which soon covered the walls of the clinic. With seemingly all the blood having been discharged from his body, the man then went limp. I attempted to resuscitate him, but strangely, there was no need. The man was comatose, but he was alive. There I was, standing in the middle of the clinic over the man, both he, myself, as well as the room completely covered in blood. It was one of the worst things I had ever experienced as a doctor, and yet, somehow, it was about to get even worse. I was still in shock from what had just happened when I heard the door to the clinic open behind me. I turned around to see a group of half a dozen more miners from the site, each one coughing, sweating, and shivering. One held a cloth to his ear that was stained red, while another attempted to stop his nose from bleeding. Whatever had infected the first patient wasn't a one-off medical event. This had the makings of an epidemic. I knew that I was in way over my head. I was just a general practitioner, not an infectious disease specialist, and I called the Center for Disease Control to get their guidance. I was told to quarantine the sick man as best I could, 
and that a rapid response team would be sent who were better equipped to deal with potential outbreaks. While I waited for the CDC to arrive, I began moving the afflicted men to a bunkhouse that had been designated for quarantining. Several more also began expelling huge amounts of blood, though unlike the first patient, none of the others survived the traumatic event. As I was putting the final infected man into a bed, I noticed something, though. There was a huge amount of heat radiating off of his lower body, and when I pulled down the blankets, I discovered something that even with all of the strange happenings, I still couldn't believe. There were huge lumps growing on his legs, each of which looked to be filled with some kind of fluid or gas, and they were extremely hot to the touch, as if the chemicals inside the lumps were creating a source of heat. As I was investigating the bizarre growths, I suddenly looked up to see that the man was no longer in a state of delirium. Instead, a crazed look had come over his eyes, and he suddenly leapt out of bed, flailing and clawing at me as if he wanted to kill me. I don't know how, but I was able to fight off the man and run out of the bunkhouse. He gave chase, though, and with no other option, I ran into a nearby storage shed. The man was beating and scratching at the door, but I was able to barricade it by dragging a heavy shelf in front of it. After several minutes of trying to break inside, he finally gave up and left. And here I remain. I'm too afraid to go back out. It seems that if the disease won't kill me, then whatever it is turning people into will. All I can do is wait for the CDC team to get here and hopefully know how to deal with whatever the situation has become. The doctor closes his small notebook and notices a drop of something fall onto the cover. He reaches up and wipes his hand across his mouth. It comes back covered in blood. The doctor didn't know what the disease was that had so rapidly spread through the workers at the mine, nor did the CDC response team when they arrived. No, it wasn't until the SCP Foundation caught word of the mysterious outbreak that someone would finally determine what was happening with what would soon be called SCP-016, which is also known as the Sentient Microorganism. SCP-016 is a blood-borne pathogen that was first discovered after a worker at a remote mine was injured while drilling into a coal seam deep beneath the earth. It is theorized that coal dust entered the wound, dust which perhaps carried dormant spores of what would become SCP-016. Over the next several days, all of the remaining employees at the mine were infected, as was the CDC crisis team that was sent to the mine to investigate the outbreak of what was potentially an undiscovered pathogen. Following the CDC's inability to deal with the disease, the SCP Foundation took over the site and quickly terminated all affected personnel in order to prevent further spread. The first infected person, Patient Zero, was taken into Foundation custody for further investigation, and the mine shaft itself was collapsed by an explosive device in order to seal it off. After studying Patient Zero, the Foundation learned a great deal about just what they were dealing with. What they found was that SCP-016 has an incubation period that can vary wildly from just 24 hours to as long as two years, with the length appearing to be dependent on the number of other potential human hosts in the immediate area. Once symptoms begin to present in an individual, they will at first look to be quite similar to the common cold. They can include coughing, a runny nose, itchy eyes, and body aches. Roughly 48 hours after the first symptoms, the infected person will experience a form of hemorrhagic fever, similar to the Ebola virus, which causes a small amount of bleeding in the lungs. This leads to the infected blood becoming aspirated, most likely in order to better spread through the air. The third stage of the disease leads to the host crashing and bleeding out, as they start to bleed profusely from multiple body orifices, including the nose, tear ducts, mouth, and even through the pores of their skin. Their blood pressure will also skyrocket during this final stage, and in some cases, have vomited blood as far as 5 meters. Oddly enough, although most die from the traumatic event, this almost complete exsanguination will not always result in death. Sometimes, following the removal of almost all blood from the body, the patient will somehow survive, and the pathogen inside their body will return to its dormant phase once again, before eventually repeating the process. But SCP-016 is more than just a rapid and often deadly bloodborne disease, as you will soon see. As SCP researchers studied the disease, what they discovered was that it had a very strange property that sets it apart from other hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and the Marburg virus. What they found was that when someone infected with SCP-016 is placed into a high-stress situation, such as one where their life is being threatened, SCP-016 will transition from rapidly reproducing inside of its host's body to instead 
begin rewriting their host's actual DNA. This genetic manipulation, combined with the stimulation of rapid cell division, leads to the host undergoing major physiological changes and in extremely small amounts of time. In just 24 hours, the host can begin showing physical changes to their body, and a complete bodily reconstruction can occur in less than two weeks. Most of the hosts who begin to undergo physical changes will not survive the process, due to how heavily the transformation stresses the body, but those that do will be changed in more than just physical ways. They'll exhibit hyper-aggressive behaviors not dissimilar to those infected by rabies. And it's theorized that the pathogen may cause this behavior in order to better spread the virus. When the Foundation realized that SCP-016 was capable of these transformative effects, they immediately undertook a number of experiments on D-Class personnel in order to better understand their full extent. In the first test, a D-Class was infected with SCP-016, and as soon as they began showing symptoms, their cell was slowly flooded with water in order to stimulate the life-threatening situation needed to trigger the transformation process. Over the next 24 hours, researchers watched as the subject appeared to develop gills which would allow it to survive in the now water-filled cell. The transformations didn't stop there, though, and over the next two weeks, the subject also had their limbs change into fins, their eyesight deteriorated, and their sense of hearing increased as they developed an echolocation ability very similar to the one employed by whales and dolphins. The experiment was concluded by removing all of the water from the cell leading to the death of the subject from asphyxiation as they could no longer breathe in the open air. A similar experiment was performed on another D-Class, but this time, instead of taking on aquatic animal properties, the D-Class experienced rapid muscle growth and their knuckles grew bone-like protrusions. It attempted to use both of these to break through the door of their flooding cell, but they were unable to breach the reinforced steel and soon died from drowning. The Foundation now knew that the virus could react in different ways to the same situation. The same experiment was run a third time, but in this instance, the infected D-Class exhibited an entirely different means of trying to escape. The subject had a massive growth appear on its chest, which seemed to be fed from two different tubes of flesh, also emanating from the subject's body. Fearing what it planned to do, the Foundation ended the experiment early and terminated the subject. An autopsy revealed that the growth was actually a hollow chamber that was being fed by the tubes with oxygen and acetylene gas, which when combined in sufficient amounts would cause a massive combustion event. In other words, SCP-016 was turning the subject into a living bomb. Moving on from flooded cell tests, the researchers next left the D-Class inside of a room with no stressing elements and instead told them to focus on growing a pair of wings. Without any reason to begin the transformation process, SCP-016 went through its normal stages, and the subject died from blood loss without any other changes occurring. In the final test, a D-Class was placed inside of an acrylic box that was suspended over a mine shaft, with a timer attached indicating the time when the bottom of the box would open and drop the D-Class into the thousand-foot deep shaft. This D-Class was also told to focus on growing wings that would allow them to survive the plunge. The subject began to transform over the next 24 hours, but rather than grow wings, they instead developed a tentacle-like appendage on their arm that was capable of producing silk similar to a spider's spinneret. They used the silk-producing organ to secure themselves to the box, showing that subjects did not appear to be able to control the way in which SCP-016 would alter their bodies. This experiment concluded when the timer reached zero and the bomb attached to it detonated, as had been the plan all along. Following this last test, SCP-016 samples were placed into containment, and access to the sample for experimental purposes is only allowed with prior authorization from Level 4 or O5 personnel, with full documentation of the proposed experiment required beforehand. Failure to follow any of these procedures will lead to the offending personnel being reassigned to D-Class duty or terminated. SCP-016 has been classified as Keter and the only existing sample is kept in a petri dish which is under extreme lockdown inside of a 5 by 5 by 5 meter room, where the temperature is kept below 0 degrees Celsius at all times. Should an outbreak of SCP-016 occur, all infected personnel are to be immediately terminated on site, and if the infection cannot be contained within 48 hours, then the on-site nuclear device is to be detonated prior to any additional personnel being evacuated. While the containment procedures may sound callous, unfortunately when it comes to anomalous pathogens as dangerous as SCP-016, no chances can be taken. It's a quiet day in a small American town. 
It's warm, with a slight breeze. A calm, simple Sunday, just like so many others. Very few people set their alarms, and most are still asleep at 8 a.m. It's the kind of town where everyone knows and trusts everyone else. After all, what are good neighbors for? While his wife still sleeps back in their modest home, a retired man in his mid-60s decides to start the day off right. With a rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other, he makes his way down the side of a grassy embankment towards his favorite fishing spot along the local river. He's even got a pair of neatly cut sandwiches in an old-fashioned metal lunch pail, the picture of small-town bliss. But something he sees stops him in his tracks. Something large, floating in the water. He freezes. He wants to write it off as driftwood or some trash that someone has thrown into the river, but in his heart of hearts, he knows better than that. What's floating in the water is a human corpse. Not long after, the local sheriff's department is on the scene, dredging the body out of the water. It's about as small and underfunded as you can expect for a group of police officers from a place where nothing ever seems to happen. There hadn't been a murder in this quaint little burg in years. When they turn over the body, it isn't hard to make a positive ID. The pallid, water-bloated face of a well-known local man stares up at them with blank, dead eyes. Some in attendance gasp at the sight of it. It had been years since the last murder in town. But when that last murder had occurred, the prime suspect had been this very same man. Ten years prior, he had been a successful local mechanic, but that all changed when his wife turned up dead in a field, her face caved in by some kind of heavy bludgeoning instrument. It was a brutal crime, the most horrific the town had ever seen. Reporters traveled in from all over the state to cover it, and that's when the web of secrets tied around this one tragic incident began to truly unravel. It was an open secret in town that the man and his wife weren't exactly on the fondest of terms. He was known for having affairs with women half his age. Rumor had it that his wife was tired of being betrayed and humiliated by her good-for-nothing philandering husband and was finally going to break it off. With the knowledge of his infidelity being so public, she'd take him for all he was worth in divorce court. And it wasn't long after these rumors began that she turned up dead. Soon fingers were pointed, most of them, naturally, in the man's direction. He lawyered up and denied every charge but in the court of public opinion, he'd already been convicted. That, however, was the only court he'd ever be convicted in. Despite the wealth of circumstantial evidence, there wasn't enough to convict him of his wife's killing. He was acquitted of all charges and went free, despite his reputation in town taking a severe dive. In the next few years, he'd marry one of his very young mistresses, and the news story would fade away back into the darkness of small-town rumors and hearsay. The murder of his wife would remain forever unsolved. With all the context in mind, the fishermen, a few locals, and the handful of police officers stare down at the dead face of the man, his soaked body sprawled out on the riverbank. A police deputy uses a gloved hand to tilt his head upward slightly, revealing the long, deep wound in his throat, carved so deep it cuts to bone. His throat had been slashed, and whoever had done it had been extremely thorough. The identity of the victim had been confirmed, as had the method of murder. Only one question remained. Who murdered him? Hours later, across town, a man wakes up alone in bed after a long, refreshing sleep. His young wife of five years went downstairs a few hours before to do some chores and cook breakfast, leaving him to his rest. He rubs the sleep from his eyes and yawns. It's a sunny day outside. How wonderful. And he can smell breakfast cooking downstairs. He smiles, gets up, dresses, and makes his way down the stairs at a leisurely pace. He can hear his wife humming in the kitchen. As he passes the threshold, he calls her name, and she freezes up. Her body shakes slightly. Is that fear? He doesn't understand. He steps closer. Suddenly, she turns and screams at him, like he's an intruder wearing a ski mask and holding out a knife. He tells her that it's just him, that everything is fine. He begs her to explain what's going on. Instead, she asks what he's doing in her house and threatens to call the police. He has no idea what's going on. He takes another step forward, and she reacts severely. His young wife grabs the handle of her frying pan and swings it, hitting him as sausages and hot oil fly through the air. He shrieks in a mix of pain, shock, and pure terror before running out of the room. What is happening? Has his wife lost her mind? He needs to get help immediately. He rushes out of his house, but when he reaches the street outside, he finds no safety or comfort, only confused, judgmental stares from his supposed neighbors. They all turn to look at him with the exact same expression as his wife, a look that says, who are you? 
As he continues to run, calling for help and fighting back the pain of his oil-scalded skin, he just gets more of those same stares from everyone he encounters. They look at him like he's some kind of raving madman, not someone who'd just been the victim of a random and brutal domestic assault. And yet, back at his home, his wife is already calling the local police to tell them about the stranger who'd just broken into her house and tried to attack her. The sheriff's department deputy on the other end of the line can't believe what he's hearing. A man turns up dead in the local river, and before they can even give his wife the news, she's calling to report that a stranger had tried to attack her in her own home. Could it be any more obvious that this stranger was the one behind her husband's murder? Given that everyone knows everyone in a town like this, it stands to reason that her husband's killer and his wife's home invader must have come from out of town, perhaps a drifter or someone her husband had owed money to. Given the kind of person he was, it was no surprise that he'd burned some kind of bridge badly enough that someone out there would want him dead and act on that desire. Case closed. All that was left to do now was catch this violent madman and bring him to justice before he could hurt anyone else. What kind of justice would they give him exactly? Well, they could decide on the particulars later. As the man continues his frantic run across town, searching in vain for somebody, anybody to come to his aid, rumors begin to spread through town. After all, in a place where everyone knows everyone, people have a tendency to talk. It doesn't take long for half of the town to hear about the local man who'd been found dead in the river with his throat slashed open, that the same maniac that killed him had made an attempt on his young wife's life and she just barely managed to fight him off, that the murderer had come in from out of town and that now he was running through the streets, babbling like a psychopath. It doesn't take long for a consensus to form. It's clear that, if left to his own devices, this outsider will only hurt more people. Who will it be next? It could be any of them. The townsfolk feel afraid, upset, unsafe, but most of all, they feel paranoid. The shadow of the maniac seems to be lurking around every corner. If they want to keep themselves safe and avenge the death of the poor man in the river, they'll need to take justice into their own hands. Or this intruder could completely upend their town's quiet life. It's the only way. They unlock their gun safes and arm themselves with shotguns, handguns, and rifles. Those without guns grab bats, hammers, and knives. Some grab shovels and pitchforks from their tool sheds. This loose maniac may be dangerous, but they have numbers on their side. Together, they'll find him and give him what he deserves. The man is still running through the streets, in pain, wondering where everyone has gone. His life is falling apart around him, and he doesn't even know why. Is this all a nightmare? Is he going insane? Before long, he can hear footsteps. People are approaching in groups, yelling, chanting. He sees a crowd turn a nearby corner and stare. Guns, knives, literal pitchforks and torches, wide, bulging eyes and born teeth. Someone points at him and barks, There he is! Get him! That's when he realizes that, for some reason, these maniacs have it in for him too. He turns tail and begins to run. He hasn't gone insane. Everyone else has. He can hear the thundering of their many footsteps chasing him. He ducks and screams as gunshots ring out, whizzing past him. Some even throw rocks all these people. This isn't fear, this is pure, undiluted rage. They want to kill him in the street in broad daylight. He hears some of them screaming, Murderer! Murderer! We'll get you! In his terrified mind, he wonders, is this what this is all about? His first wife? He'd been acquitted, it was so many years ago. Why would they all turn on him? Why now? It's… Relief swells and washes over him when he sees a police cruiser making its way towards him from the other end of the street. They'd save him from these bloodthirsty maniacs. The car comes to a stop, and a pair of familiar police officers step out. They seem oddly calm given the situation. The man approaches, trying to plead with him through a throat racked by pain, exhaustion, and terror. The mob is hot on his heels now. He needs help. He desperately needs help. But as he tries to form the words, he gets a hard lesson in the fact that these police officers are the wrong people to come to for that. The one closest to him slides the baton out of his belt and strikes the man across the face. His face feels a sudden explosion of pain as his cheekbone shatters. Before he can even register what's going on, the other officer strikes the back of his leg with his baton, and he crumbles to the ground. The two of them begin beating him relentlessly while he begs for mercy through his broken teeth, and it's not long until the rest of the mob catches up and surrounds him. With a final strike to the face, everything goes black. When he opens his eyes, it's nighttime, and he can feel something constricting his wrists and neck. Heavy ropes cut into his skin. His hands are bound, and there's a noose around his neck, the other end tied to a branch of a tree above him. His feet teeter precariously on a stool below. The rope has no slack. 
He is surrounded by the townspeople, all armed and staring hatefully at him. The only light comes from their burning torches. The sheriff stands at the front of the crowd, his weeping wife standing next to him. With a stony face, he dictates that, for the crime of murder, he has been found guilty and is sentenced to hang by the neck until he is dead. His eyes widen one last time in pure panic as the sheriff holds up a photo of the dead man pulled from the river. What? No, there must be some kind of terrible mistake. I didn't kill that man. I am that man. I am. I swear. Please. But before he can even form the words, his own wife steps forward and kicks out the stool from under his feet. While this story of fear, paranoia, mob mentality, and unspeakable violence may seem as sadly natural and human as breathing air, the spark that ignited this tinderbox was decidedly inhuman. This is SCP-3852, also known as Small Town Justice. First, meet SCP-3852-1. No matter what your gut feeling may be, I assure you that you do not recognize him. He's an unidentified male corpse, and also an intrinsic factor in the SCP-3852 phenomenon. There are many SCP-3852-1 instances, and all of them are physically and biologically identical. And if ever you encounter one of them, unless the SCP Foundation can intervene in time, something terrible will happen. To put it simply, one of these unidentified corpses will manifest within the bounds of a small town or village typical with a population of over 2,000 people on the East Coast or in the Midwest of the United States. Upon someone seeing the SCP-3852-1 corpse, the SCP-3852 phenomenon will begin. Despite having no internal or external injuries in an objective sense, the victims of its anomalous effects will believe that it is a person from their town who has been recently murdered, despite the fact that this victim is very much alive in town. While initially it was believed that the selection of the victim, dubbed SCP-3852-2, was entirely random, as more and more SCP-3852 incidents popped up since the first was recorded in 1978, a pattern began to emerge. It was discovered that the victims were all people who were believed to have committed some serious or repeated crimes in the past, but who were acquitted or otherwise cleared of charges. But when the phenomenon begins, a frightening switch occurs. While the body will take on the identity of the victim for a number of the township citizens, the actual victim will become a depersonalized stranger, an outsider, someone to be looked upon with active suspicion that soon grows into paranoia and, eventually, uncontrollable rage and bloodlust. But the fury of the mob being directed at one person is one thing. A town being dragged into what seems like an outright civil war is quite another. The mob will arm themselves and go on the hunt for the accused. During the process, if anyone in town attempts to stop them, such as when individuals try to stand up on behalf of the accused, encouraging the mob to exercise caution and approach the situation rationally, as happens in many SCP-3852 events, they too will become perceived differently. It is estimated that between 11 and 27 percent of the affected community will not be swayed to join the vigilante group, and when they refute the accusations, they will be accused of trying to impede the course of justice. When the violence eventually breaks out though, as it always does, they will not be spared. When the victim that started it all is finally found, they will be violently executed, at which point the townsfolk will all begin behaving normally and life will resume once more as if nothing ever happened. In the aftermath, people will give inconsistent accounts of what occurred, but none will experience any long-term traumatic effects from taking part in or witnessing the violence. Since the phenomenon was first noted back in 1978, the SCP Foundation has recorded 16 different SCP-3852 incidents, some of which have been appended to the official files for expository purposes. One such event, labeled EV-3852-07F3T, is the very first that the Foundation encountered. During this 3852 event, which occurred in a small town in Indiana, 368 people were brought under the thrall of the anomaly's effects when the SCP-3852-1 body was encountered in the town square just after sunrise and was identified as belonging to a 28-year-old local unemployed man named Glenn. It didn't take long for the citizens to turn on the still-living Glenn, causing the poor young man to try and flee from the hundreds of people baying for his blood. He was eventually overtaken by the townsfolk while trying to cross a river and escape from the town. He was pulled from the river and beaten viciously. He was then dragged back into the town square and hanged for his perceived crime of murdering himself. 
The SCP Foundation managed to recover the anomalous SCP-3852-1 corpse before questioning the remaining townsfolk and administering amnestics. An even worse event occurred 18 years later in Ohio, recorded as EV-3852-15C1K. This time, 572 people were affected by SCP-3852 when the body of a controversial local man named Hector was discovered in a nearby schoolyard. Hector was a former factory worker until he was involved in a drunk driving incident that resulted in another driver dying and left Hector paralyzed from the waist down. When the body was found, suspicion of course immediately fell upon the real Hector for the crime. When roughly 23% of the community objected to these accusations, they also became targets of the violent mob intent on taking Hector's life out of their twisted sense of justice. When later interviewing one of the mob's ringleaders, a 52-year-old named Matthew Escott, the Foundation discovered that neither him nor any of the other mob members noticed the strange coincidence that Hector's killer was also a paraplegic man of about the same size and build as Hector. As predicted, nobody involved seemed to carry any guilt or even full awareness of what they'd carried out in pursuit of justice. Hector and those who were attempting to defend him were chased into an abandoned barn on the edge of town for a final standoff. The mob dragged out Hector and his defenders and brutally murdered them all. MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, a group specializing in small-town anomalies, was called in to retrieve the SCP-3852-1 body and clean up the mess in the aftermath. Incidentally, a video of the carnage was somehow leaked onto the video-sharing website YouTube some years later, causing a containment fiasco for the Foundation. The investigation into the cameraman who filmed and presumably uploaded the video is ongoing and any information you may have into their identity should be reported to the nearest Foundation agent so that they can be properly terminated, debriefed. SCP-3852 is an incredibly insidious anomaly, because even in the most desirable scenario possible, at least one person is doomed to die. In order for the town to be pacified and released from the anomalous effects of SCP-3852, the victim designated SCP-3852-2 must be neutralized. There simply appears to be no other way. When the village idiots are dispatched to a town in the thrall of SCP-3852, they are under strict instructions to execute the SCP-3852-2 individual as quickly as possible and distribute amnestics in order to avoid any additional or unnecessary bloodshed before collecting the SCP-3852-1 body and bringing it back for containment with the others at a secure Foundation site. Naturally, the SCP Foundation remains on the lookout for strange, hostile activity arising in small towns for fear that it could be another SCP-3852 incident unfolding. There is no way of predicting where the anomaly will strike next, given that anywhere with a population over 2,000 on the East Coast or in the Midwest is vulnerable to its influence. As such, it has been given the Keter class to reflect the challenges it poses to reliable containment. The fact that SCP-3852 seems to attack people with some prior history of accused crime does nothing to narrow down this roster either. After all, every small town, no matter how idyllic, holds dark secrets. SCP-3852 just provides a way to bring those secrets into the light. What was that? The man and woman's hike through a gently rolling portion of the Rocky Mountains has just taken a turn for the dangerous. There's something there in the bush, the man tells her before stepping in front of her in a defensive pose. They watch the bush intently. There's a slight rustling of the leaves as if something is inside. The man picks up a stick from the ground and holds it in front of him, ready to strike whatever fearsome beast is lurking in the underbrush. The rustling stops, but the man doesn't move from his protective stance. Do you think it's gone? The woman asks. The man isn't sure. He leans in towards the bush, searching for signs of what might be hiding inside when… Ah! The man screams and falls backwards as the creature emerges from the bush. Aww! The woman cries. It's a pika! She kneels down to get a closer look at the adorable little creature. Pikas are native to this part of Colorado, and they resemble rabbits but with small, rounded ears. She watches it hop back off the trail before turning around to see her friend lying tangled in the branches of a tree. She can't help but laugh as she offers a hand to help pull him out of his predicament. Are you alright? She asks between fits of laughter. Yes, he's fine. The only thing hurt was his pride. He notices a small red spot on his arm and rubs it, but it doesn't seem to hurt at all. His attention is diverted by the woman, though, who is marveling at the tree he was just stuck in. Free of the branches, he can appreciate now that the tree really is incredible. It looks like a huge blue spruce, but the name is a complete misnomer, because this tree is a vibrant red color. I've never seen anything like it, 
she says, and the man hasn't either. Neither knows what species it is, and, strangely, there don't seem to be any others like it. Maybe this is the result of an odd genetic defect that turns blue spruces red. After admiring the tree for a moment, the pair decides that they've hiked far enough and that they should probably head back to the car. She jokes that he's likely exhausted from his run-in with a wild animal, and he laughs, but clearly his ego has been bruised. The man stops his car in front of the woman's house, and she thanks him for taking her on the hike. As she starts to get out, though, he stops her. He asks if she wants to go do something else, like dinner? The woman thanks him for his offer, but she has to be up early the next day for work. Just a quick drink then? An hour? Thirty minutes? The woman tries her best to let her friend down easy, explaining that she likes him as a friend and as only that. The man opens his mouth to respond, but she stops him. If he valued their friendship, then he wouldn't try to take advantage of it by using it as a backdoor to dating her. The man again looks like his pride has been shattered. He apologizes and admits that she is right. It's just that he has such a good time with her that he never wants it to end. She gives him a sad smile as she closes the car door, and he watches her enter her house before he finally drives away. It's two weeks later when the man's phone rings. It's his friend. She explains that she's been thinking a lot about what he said in the car and that she likes spending time with him too. Maybe there could be something more to their relationship. The man can't believe it. Is this really happening? The woman is serious. She'd like to take him up on that dinner offer, if he's still interested. Her treat. She wants to know what he is doing right- Ah! The man suddenly yelps in pain. Is he okay? What was that sound? Yes, I'm fine, it was nothing, the man tells her. It's just that now… now's not a good time. The woman doesn't understand. She thought he'd want to see her. She explains that she's leaving town for a work trip the next day and will be gone for a couple of weeks. She was hoping she could see him before she left, but… The man cries out in pain again. He tells her that he hasn't been feeling well all day, but that he'll be alright. Okay, well, get well soon. I'll call you when I get back. They exchange goodbyes, and the man hangs up the phone. The man looks terrible. His skin is pale, and his face looks hollow and gaunt. He looks down at his arm and sees that the veins themselves appear to be moving, pulsing, and vibrating. He screams again in agony and falls to the floor, clutching his arm. After writhing on the floor, he manages to summon the strength to reach for the phone. His hand searches on the table above him, and eventually he's able to knock it onto the floor. He grabs the phone and starts to dial. Nine. One. Before he can press one again, another wave of intense searing pain consumes him. Several weeks later, the woman is standing outside the man's house. Mail and newspapers are piled up on his front porch, as if no one has been in or out in some time. She knocks on the door, but there's no response. Hello? She calls out, but still nothing. She's very worried. She's tried calling him several times, but he never answered or returned her messages. She tries the doorknob. And to her surprise, the front door swings open. She steps inside and the room is dark. She's also immediately hit by a strong aroma of… pine? She searches on the wall and finds the switch. She turns on the lights and can't believe what she sees standing in front of her. There in the middle of the room is a massive spruce tree, its upper branches pressing against the ceiling. She reaches out and touches the tree's vivid red branches. They feel sticky and wet. She pulls her hand away and looks down to see that it's covered in a red substance. That's when she notices something else. Stuck among the trunk at the base of the tree is the half-consumed body of her friend. Unfortunately, this pair would never have the opportunity to see their feelings take root and grow, because unbeknownst to them, this beautiful tree is actually a very deadly anomaly, known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-867, but which is perhaps better known by its very appropriate nickname, Blood Spruce. SCP-867 is, or at least appears to be, quite similar to the species of tree Piscea pungens, better known as the Blue Spruce. Of course, there are a number of dramatic differences between 867 and its non-anomalous counterpart. Visually, and most obvious, is the coloration. While Blue Spruces, as the name implies, are typically a blue-green color, SCP-867 is a deep, vibrant red. There's another major visual difference too, with the blood spruce lacking any sort of seed cones that you would normally expect to find. With no pine cones to protect and spread seeds, you'd be right to ask how SCP-867 goes about reproducing. The answer to that question is what makes this beautiful tree such a dangerous anomaly. 
The secret to how SCP-867 reproduces is found in its leaves. While they look like pine needles, SCP-867's leaves are, in fact, needles. Their structure is very similar to that of hypodermic needles, and each one contains a single long thin seed which sits above a small gas pocket at the base. When a living creature touches the leaves, the tree immediately reacts. It triggers the gas pocket in the base of the leaf to release, which injects the seed into the skin of whatever touched it. The process is quite similar to that found in auto-injectors, like those used to quickly treat allergic reactions. The seed itself is extremely small and is coated in a liquid that has both anesthetic and coagulant properties, which makes the process virtually undetectable. Once implanted in the skin, these seeds can lay dormant for up to two weeks before they begin the germination process and the true horror of SCP-867 is revealed. Once the seeds begin to sprout and grow, they will not seek to penetrate through the skin like a plant rising out of the soil. Instead, the strange plant will grow within its host's body, spreading throughout the circulatory system. This process is extremely painful for the host. The plant's tendrils wind through their veins and capillary system, stretching and pressing against them as the blood spruce grows within them. Eventually, the ever-increasing size of the plant's tendrils becomes too much and the veins will begin to rupture. This leads to severe internal bleeding and soon after, the death of the host. The entire process is quite quick, with it only taking 24 hours from when the seeds first sprout to the host dying. But that single day will feel like an eternity to the afflicted individual as they feel the plant rapidly growing inside of their body. But even though the host has expired, this parasitoid tree is far from finished with them, or at least their body. Soon after death, a new instance of the blood spruce will burst from the body. The red tree is quite small at first, but it will continue to quickly grow just as it did within its host's body and can reach maturity in just 30 days. And unlike most other plants, SCP-867 is able to grow regardless of light or soil conditions because it does not produce food via photosynthesis. No, this plant is carnivorous. As it grows, the 867 will slowly consume its host's body until nothing remains except the blood red tree. Instances of SCP-867 were first identified in Colorado during the 1990s, following reports of numerous disappearances of hikers and park rangers. The SCP Foundation dispatched a team to the area to investigate, and they soon discovered numerous instances of the previously unidentified tree. Several still young specimens were acquired, though unfortunately, this led to the deaths of several agents, who were not yet aware of just how dangerous the red spruces could be. Once their threat level was properly assessed, Several specimens were flagged for containment and research purposes, while all of the other identified instances still in the wild were destroyed. The remaining instances of SCP-867 were classified as Euclid and are now securely kept at a Foundation biocontainment site. Direct human contact with the plants is normally not allowed and remote rovers are used for the majority of tests and upkeep. If for any reason it is necessary for a human to enter 867's containment cell, they are to wear full hazmat suits with a Kevlar underlayer, and upon exiting the cell, must undergo a full herbicidal treatment and inspection. Should any possible puncture marks be discovered, they will be forced to quarantine for no less than 15 days. Ah, nature. It's so beautiful, peaceful, and calming, yet seems determined to try and kill us in any number of ways. If you're out hiking or camping in the woods, try to remember this extremely famous adage which I may or may not have just made up. It goes, Leaves of three, let them be. Needles of red, well, you're probably already dead. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, 
more evil than any ordinary man. There's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge, particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So, even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow, towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular, but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man, where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London. The first of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be. Could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with the knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. 
Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand. There's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also clearly no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content, but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. 
His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so, and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person, and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, 
Also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, The Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting king of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the king of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. A young researcher is thrown against the wall so hard that his spine breaks. A man turned into a scarecrow. A woman unmoored from gravity. A man losing a vital component of his brain. All these poisoned prizes can be yours if you have your hands on a certain special object. The thief is confused, to say the least, at the sight before him. It isn't exactly what he has been expecting to find on his travel to the Forgotten Cave. The strange object is displayed on an altar, with a beam emanating from somewhere above, shining a bright column of moonlight onto it. This must be the treasure that he was sent here for. But what was this strange treasure? He's still aching all over from his long journey, many days and nights spent crossing the desert just to reach his destination. All around the cavern are precious stones and gold coins, jewelry and riches beyond the thief's wildest dreams, and it's all his for the taking. Just as long as he fulfills his promise to the strange, decrepit old man he met at the entrance of the cave. The thief steps closer to the altar and examines the object the old man told him to recover. Upon hearing the word, lamp, the thief had been picturing an ornate oil jug with a handle and spout, not this… thing. The thief had never seen an object quite like it. It's a tall, thin neck that winds upwards from a flat, circular base. The top looks like the hem of a dress, but far smaller and made from green glass. It's a lamp, all right, but not as this thief would know it. He lifts it up to get a closer look and notices something, an empty space beneath the stained glass lampshade. It looks like there's a part missing. Nearby, he comes across another curiosity, a rounded, almost perfect sphere of glass, with an elongated protrusion terminating in a metal connector. It seems like it would be the perfect fit for the vacant port on the lamp. So, figuring out how to affix the two, the thief attaches the light bulb to the lamp. To his surprise, the bulb begins to glow a light blue. Cautiously, he places it back down and backs away, uncertain about what is about to happen next. A sudden plume of blue smoke erupts from the lamp, and the thief ducks for cover, thinking the object has exploded. But there's no loud sound, no flames, and this prompts him to peek out from his hiding place to see a mysterious figure emerging from the cloud. It looks to be an older man, hovering above the ground, not legs, but a tail of the same smoke as the rest of his body. Now the thief recognizes what's going on. He's grown up with stories of creatures almost exactly like this one, and it fills him with a rush of excitement. It's a genie. He can remember as clear as day tales about genies. They are mystical wish-givers, imprisoned within lamps and then bound to the person who discovers them. 
Once it emerges from its slumber, a genie will then offer whoever freed it three wishes. Hey, you there! You gonna hide all night? Come on, kid, let's get this over with. What'll it be? The genie asks rather brashly. The thief approaches the smoky, translucent figure and immediately knows exactly what to do. He's already thought of exactly what to ask for. The wish that can free him from his life of stealing and poverty. Genie, I wish for you to make me rich, he says. As soon as he's finished his sentence, the genie vanishes, leaving the thief confused. Surely he still had another two wishes. He's startled as the light bulb he had affixed to the lamp suddenly explodes, for real this time, with a spark and a shower of small glass shards. Before the thief can so much as call for the genie to return and demand that it explain itself, he feels a sickly churning in his stomach. Something is very, very wrong. After a few short moments of violent and painful sickness, the thief lays dead on the floor of the cavern. If one from a more advanced period of history were to examine him, they'd find the thief's body exposed to an extremely large overdose of vitamin C, enough to kill him. The genie had made him rich. It just goes to show the old warning to be careful what you wish for is always applicable, especially when you find yourself making a wish from SCP-4035. Although it might look like an unassuming table lamp from the outside, within it stored an ancient entity who also happens to be wildly unpredictable and a bit of a jerk, to be completely honest. Anyone examining SCP-4035 will notice the first odd thing about it fairly quickly. The lamp itself is rather unremarkable, composed of a simple iron base with a conical lampshade above. Its patterned stained glass sports a number of shades of green, and overall, it looks like the type of lamp you might find at a grandparent's house, or a distant elderly relative who always tells you just how much you've grown when you visit every five to ten years, and whose home decor hasn't changed since the mid-1970s. But the first of SCP-4035's many strange properties is that it doesn't actually seem to work. Closer inspection of the lamp itself will reveal that it doesn't actually have any electrical components whatsoever. There's no wiring running through it, no cable leading to a plug that can be affixed to a wall socket, no switch, nothing. Except for a standard light bulb socket. So naturally, anyone coming across this seemingly useless table lamp will feel compelled to find a light bulb and see if the thing actually works. That's when things get even stranger. Light bulbs placed into SCP-4035 will indeed illuminate, despite the lack of electricity powering the lamp. There won't appear to be anything unusual about its functionality at first, other than the bulbs inserted into SCP-4035 will produce a blue-tinted light. But surely that's just because of its ornate stained glass lampshade, right? Wrong. Shortly after placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, that's when he emerges. Who is he? Well, the Foundation knows him as SCP-4035-1, but for the sake of brevity, let's just call him the Genie. Emerging from the lamp will be an entity that seems to be gaseous in its composition, lacking a tangible, physical form, and instead appearing to be incorporeal, almost like a ghost, or a man made of vapors. This being has been described as having the characteristics of a middle-aged, balding man, looking to be somewhere between his 40s and 50s. Whenever he appears, the genie always looks the same, always sporting a patchy brown suit coat. Beneath, however, he has no visible legs, and in their place is a cloud of blue gas that emanates from the lower body of SCP-4035-1. As soon as SCP-4035-1 appears, he will strike up a conversation with whoever placed a light bulb in the lamp that contains him. Now, you might be forgiven for, perhaps, predicting how the next interaction typically plays out. After all, you've seen Aladdin. A genie appears and offers to grant the person who discovered its lamp three wishes. However, the person making the wishes has to be very careful with how they word their requests to the magical entity. One wrong word, and they might find themselves suffering some unforeseen consequences. Or perhaps it unfolds like other myths and fables involving genies. The wishes are granted, but they come at a terrible, maybe even fatal, price. Well, you'd be almost right to expect something like that from this genie. But let's just say that SCP-4035-1 doesn't exactly enjoy doing things by the book. The genie introduces itself, usually under some randomly selected false name. Some favorites of his during past encounters have included Bobby, Spiff, Danny Fry, and Josephy Krakowski. Now you can see why just calling him the genie is a lot simpler. 
Anyway, after he manifests, SCP-4035-1 won't offer three wishes, but instead offers to sell a product to whoever placed a light bulb in SCP-4035. Attempts to ask the genie to elaborate on the product being offered are usually met with an evasive response and little detail being revealed. Once the person or subject talking to SCP-4035-1 responds, the genie then, in effect, grants their wish. They can just be trying to converse with the entity, but it will regard even a completely unrelated verbal response as an answer. The subjects typically receive a biological modification or other anomalous ability that directly relates to what they said to the genie, and we do mean directly. Once again, you might be forgiven for expecting that being granted supernatural powers by a magical genie would be a fun experience. After all, who doesn't want anomalous abilities? But be warned, the abilities SCP-4035-1 hands out usually fit the description of lackluster and disappointing. Why? Well, because typically, the anomalous modifications the genie makes are highly detrimental to the subject in question. You see, SCP-4035-1 has a habit of taking things extremely literally, almost to a pedantic extent, intentionally misinterpreting and leaving any who accidentally make a wish with it harmful changes to their minds and bodies. And like most genies from mythology, this one doesn't undo the wishes that it grants. After bestowing someone with abilities that usually leave them in agony or distress, the genie disappears back into SCP-4035, causing the light bulb inside to violently explode. Should someone attempt to replace it and get the genie to reverse whatever horrific change it has made, its voice will emanate from the lamp and yell, Sorry kid, no refunds. But how bad could these abilities possibly be? Well, to find out the answer, you only have to take a look at a select few of the numerous tests the SCP Foundation has done involving SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock, at one point in time, is assigned to be the head researcher in charge of conducting experiments on SCP-4035. The approach he takes is sending members of disposable D-Class personnel to interact with the lamp and genie, then record the results. The first test unfolds as follows. The subject, a D-Class with the designation number D-4088, is sent into the containment chamber that houses SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock instructs him to place a light bulb in the socket and request telepathic abilities from SCP-4035-1. However, as the genie emerges, its sudden presence startles the D-Class, and he makes an expletive exclamation that we won't repeat. It was words to the effect of, What the heck is this? As a result, the genie grants D-4088 an ability that relates to the sentence he said, and to call it particularly unpleasant might be something of an understatement. You see, because of a certain word the D-Class had used, the genie gives him the ability to identify the chemical composition of what we'll refer to as waste. The fact that he can even identify what kind of creature said waste comes from does little to make D-4088 happy with his newfound power. Dr. Bannock is forced to refine his experimentation strategy following this bungled first attempt. In the lead-up to the second test, he informs the next D-Class candidate of what exactly they will be facing when they enter the chamber, so as not to be caught by surprise at the sight of the genie. As a result, the second D-Class subject repeats the process of activating SCP-4035 and calmly repeats the request for telepathic abilities that he's been told to ask for. I'd like to be able to read minds? Unfortunately, his wording means things haven't exactly gone according to plan. Testing with this subject reveals he hasn't developed any telepathic abilities. Disappointed, Dr. Bannock has the subject released back into Foundation incarceration alongside his fellow D-Class prisoners. However, several weeks pass, and it soon becomes apparent what ability this inmate has been granted. He encounters another D-Class, one of many pulled from maximum security prisons around the globe, this particular inmate has a tattoo on his forehead of a few words in Chinese. However, to the former test subject, these phrases appear to have been translated to English and read, Cuban butter mustache. When he reveals the mistake made by his fellow inmate's tattoo artist, the subject is attacked and beaten up. He had, however, gained the ability to read minds. He can understand any form of writing on the forehead of a living being. A little time passes, and Dr. Bannock finds himself still struggling to get SCP-4035-1 to bestow any worthwhile abilities to test subjects. The genie just seems to take everything far too literally, 
interpreting every wish with no regard for normal speech and colloquialisms, even disregarding the safety of the person making the wish. Dr. Bannock conducts yet another test, sending a member of D-Class to speak with the genie and telling him to wish for muscle regeneration. The D-Class places the request with SCP-4035-1 seemingly without issue. However, then comes the next part, testing whether this new anomalous ability actually works the way Dr. Bannock intends. The subject of this latest experiment is intentionally injured. As this happens, his body appears to rapidly change. His muscular system swells up and multiplies, increasing from its original size. A successful test, right? Well, it would be, if the rapid muscle regeneration actually stopped. Before long, the D-Class test subject's muscle tissue is almost 250% bigger than its original size, making it much bigger than the rest of his body too. The subject is clearly highly distressed, although fortunately, this doesn't continue for long. Unfortunately, that's because his body can't function normally with this new rapid change, and as a result, the D-Class subject's vital signs stop after three short seconds. Getting more and more frustrated with the disastrous outcomes, Dr. Bannock makes the decision to simplify the requests made to the genie. Surely it can't misinterpret one word, can it? The next test that Bannock conducts sees yet another unwitting member of D-Class, D-1899, entering the containment chamber and placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, just like her predecessors have done. She follows her instructions, and as the genie appears, she asks for one thing. Flight. A short while later, the genie once again vanishes and leaves D-1899 with her wish. She has instantly become unaffected by the Earth's gravitational pull like normal. Within seconds, she is floating above the ground, as if experiencing the zero gravity of traveling in outer space. That certainly sounds idyllic, doesn't it? After all, who doesn't wish they could fly? To be granted the unique opportunity to view the majesty of the world from high above. Just one problem, though. Getting back down. D-1899 quickly realizes, as does an agitated Dr. Bannock, that she isn't in control of her newfound flying abilities. She can't alter her direction or return back down to ground level at will. She's stuck, floating in the air, only able to affect her trajectory by propelling herself off of solid structures. The results of SCP-4035 tests continue to be somewhat undesirable, to say the least. An interaction with the genie that begins with the phrase, uh, hey man, causes the D-Class who spoke to be suddenly replaced with a crude scarecrow. When another subject makes a wish for a new life, they die almost instantly. Only four moments later, one of the Foundation's researchers to suddenly give birth to a baby with identical genetic makeup to the now deceased D-Class. Another test sees a member of D-Class personnel enter the containment chamber with the instruction to wish for whatever they can think of. Put on the spot, they're unsure what to request when the genie appears, and instead, they only offer up the response, I don't know. Moments later, this subject falls into a catatonic state and eventually passes away. An autopsy of the subject's body reveals that their hippocampus has been removed. Thanks to the genie, they literally didn't know anything. Further testing with SCP-4035 is later carried out, however it should be noted that the next instance of a recorded experiment with a genie isn't one that was authorized by the SCP Foundation. Rather, hearing that there was a genie being tested, junior researcher Jacobson decides to try and make his ultimate wish come true. He's never been all that lucky in love, and it's left the young Foundation researcher with a little insecurity. Nothing that a visit to SCP-4035-1 can't fix, surely. Despite not being authorized to use SCP-4035, junior researcher Jacobson approaches the lamp within its containment chamber. He then repeats the process to make SCP-4035-1 appear, and then requests that the genie grant his wish. Make me more attractive? In an ideal world, this scenario wraps up with junior researcher Jacobson becoming more handsome by conventional standards, perhaps even improving his sense of insecurity as a result. But by now, you can probably guess, that isn't what happens at all. Instead, being as literal as ever, the genie grants the young researcher's wish and makes him more attractive. Seconds later, as soon as the genie has demanifested, Jacobson is suddenly flung across the containment chamber and smacked sharply against the solid wall. The sheer force of the impact gives the junior researcher a severe spinal fracture. Of course, this catches the attention of Foundation security who bring junior researcher Jacobson to the on-site medical center. 
There, he is given a full analysis, and this reveals the extent of just how attractive the genie has made him. Junior researcher Jacobson's epidermis, his outer layer of skin, has been given properties similar to that of a high-powered magnet. He has been magnetically attracted to the metallic walls of the containment chamber, resulting in a spinal injury that would claim his life only two hours later. The extensive testing with SCP-4035 is still ongoing, and as a result, the Foundation sees it fit to keep a large supply of light bulbs near the lamp's containment chamber. Dr. Bannock's research seems to indicate that while a person is in close proximity with SCP-4035, they are more likely to suffer a sudden and inexplicable speech problem. For example, the most common of these are parapraxis, commonly known as a Freudian slip, or ankyloglossia, which is a condition wherein the skin joining a person's tongue to the bottom of their mouth is shorter than usual, and this affects normal tongue movement, sometimes being called a tongue tie. Being closer to SCP-4035-1 increases the chances of suffering some form of unintended speech mistake by 68% when talking to the genie. To cut a long story short, the genie doesn't just intentionally and obtusely interpret everything literally, but also directly affects how clear a person will be while making their wish. As for exactly where SCP-4035 comes from, there's little information available. Some theories suggest it might well be an actual mythological genie who is just tired of spending so many centuries in the business of granting wishes for mortals. After all, imagine you get trapped in a desk lamp for all eternity and have to magically fulfill the requests of anyone that comes across you. Living through that for so long is liable to make a genie bitter and petty. Then again, perhaps the genie isn't even really a genuine genie. It doesn't inhabit an oil lamp, but instead a broken table lamp. And instead of granting wishes in the way they're intended, it misinterprets and takes things too literally, leaving the poor fools who thought they'd be blessed with supernatural powers to deal with the consequences. But perhaps that's the point. If nothing else, the genie residing in SCP-4035 serves as a reminder of that important lesson, to be careful what you wish for. In any case, if we were going looking for a genie, we'd take the friendly Robin Williams type over this pedantic jerk any day. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. 
Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading, and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait, he has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you, since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden, smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something, to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, 
and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blond man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. 
The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flattest were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. 
The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. A satellite floats in the cold depths of space above our pale blue dot. It positions its targeting array down at a point thousands of miles below and fires. Clack, clack, clack. A tired-looking man sitting in a coffee shop types away on his computer, taking advantage of the free Wi-Fi to send off yet another job application. Nearby, a barista is writing down orders while a businessman takes a call between quiet sips of his mocha. A teenage girl texts her friend, giggling occasionally. An old man chews his bagel just a little too loudly for comfort. Nothing appears all that out of the ordinary. Until the blast hits. Intensity level 25. The job seeker notices a faint whisper in his ear. It startles him, and he turns to look around the coffee shop, but he can't spot who was whispering to him. How odd. He turns back to his keyboard and carries on typing, but a strange feeling hangs over him. This pervasive sense that something is very wrong. His eyes turn to the businessman, and he notices something. His phone is gone, but he's still loudly talking to someone. Someone who isn't there. The barista is smiling as she seems to note down orders, but in her notebook, she's scrawling the words, getting closer, again and again and again, and she doesn't have any idea why. The teenage girl, with shifty, furtive eyes, texts her friend a message saying, this is gonna sound crazy, but I feel like someone's watching me. As the job seeker tries in vain to fight the feelings of unease, he keeps hearing the old man chewing, loud, incessant, cow-like chewing. 
it's really beginning to get on his nerves. Suddenly the thought crosses his mind that he'd actually like to kill this man. He'd like to squeeze his throat and break his jaw so that he could never chew like that again. The sudden appearance of this alien thought frightens him, and it's about to get so much worse. Intensity level 35. The job seeker starts to wonder if there's any point to this. He suspected that he'd been fired from his last job because nobody liked him. Did he really think he had a chance at getting this one? Really? What a stupid pipe dream. He's bombarded by thoughts like these that make typing more and more difficult. He notices that his hands are shaking. The chewing behind him is still so loud. He can't turn around. He knows on some level that if he does, he'll say something to the old man that he can't take back. The barista stares off into the distance, a haunted, contemplative look in her eye. The businessman gazes into his mocha like a crystal ball. The teenage girl begins to weep. The job seeker looks up when he notices something strange is happening outside. A middle-aged woman walking her dog suddenly clutches her chest like she's having a heart attack. She bends over and breathes deeply. Her dog barks at nothing, enraged by some invisible force that's all around them. Intensity level 50. Something's wrong. The voice in the job seeker's head is no longer a whisper. It's hissing and barking cruel words at him like, useless, worthless, lazy, disgusting. Each one boring into his head like a power drill. But far more frightening than the voices themselves is the fact that he believes every single thing they're saying. He's lulled into a trance by their venomous rhythm. The only thing louder is that unending chewing. The waitress calmly walks back to the counter. She picks up a jug of blistering hot coffee and begins to swig directly from it. She can feel it sizzling in her mouth, and she couldn't care less. The businessman begins an intense screaming match with somebody who isn't there, snarling and practically foaming at the mouth. The job seeker can't take that chewing anymore. He turns to the old man, ready to unload on him. But when he opens his mouth to speak, nothing comes out. He sees that the bagel is gone, but the old man is still chewing. He smiles at him, red liquid streaking his lips and teeth. The job seeker looks down at the table and sees the outline of a fingerless hand under the old man's blood-soaked napkin. Intensity level 75. Inside the coffee shop, pandemonium breaks loose. The old man lies catatonic in his booth. The businessman fights a nearby wall, knuckles and toe bones cracking against the bricks. The waitress has the teenage girl in a headlock as the girl shrieks in agony and stabs at her assailant's leg with a table fork. The job seeker looks out the window at the violence suddenly unfolding on the street. Complete strangers are attacking each other with murderous intent, biting, gouging, punching, clawing, tearing, strangling. It all looks like… fun. He picks up his laptop and tosses it through the coffee shop window, shattering the glass. As if he was ever going to get that stupid job anyway. He steps through the broken window, a new man, and picks up a large jagged shard of broken glass, ready to join in on the festivities. Intensity level Keter. Thousands of people are changed. They do unimaginable things to each other and themselves. There is chaos in homes and out on the streets, as everything collapses in a wave of terrible, unspeakable violence. Nothing will ever be the same. Thankfully, the horrors that you just observed were only part of a simulation, one created by the SCP Foundation, and intended to demonstrate the worst-case scenarios of various anomalies on their roster. These events have not yet come to pass, but they very easily could if there was even a minor accident with the rogue anomalous satellite known as SCP-923. The SCP-923 satellite consists of a large parabolic dish made from unknown alloys, as well as a powerful internal reactor that produces massive quantities of energy and radiation, all to power the satellite's mysterious anomalous firing mechanism. 923 appears to select specific targets that it then fires a blast of energy at. Those in the proximity of the target when the beam hits are also affected, with the severity of the damage contingent on the intensity of the blast. Like many anomalies, its origins are shrouded in mystery. SCP-923 displays a degree of artificial intelligence and posts reports on its own condition and operations to the O5 Council Secured Information Relay Network, a classified communication network reserved for Foundation employees with Level 5 clearance. According to 923's own data, it was constructed in a Foundation research and development site. This is congruent with blueprints for a planned offensive satellite which was to be constructed at that very site but the project had actually been cancelled due to logistical concerns. The O5 Council deems it extremely important that SCP-923 never be made aware of this fact. Currently, since two-way lines of communication have been established, 923 obeys the orders of the O5 Council, not firing on a target unless given authorization by them. 
If it ever discovers that it technically isn't a Foundation construction, it runs the risk of going rogue and triggering some extremely dangerous outcomes, to say the least. SCP-923 was first discovered after it started a correspondence with the O5 Relay Network, posting a message that it had completed another successful termination, despite no such termination actually being ordered. Over the next several hours, this process continued, as the 923 satellite sent in termination report after termination report, totaling 57 by the time it stopped, 55 of which were later confirmed to be actual deaths, with the other two being deemed inconclusive. Adjustments have since been made to ensure that SCP-923 can't access any information on the network that hasn't been directly intended for it. SCP-923 is an extremely effective weapon. Depending on its operator's level of tolerance for collateral damage, it can completely reverse its orbit to detect and fire upon a target anywhere on Earth in a very short period of time. All it needs are the target's GPS coordinates, their altitude, the intended time of firing, and a selected level of intensity. This, incidentally, is where things get interesting with the tests the Foundation conducted. Naturally, they wanted to see the kind of firepower that each level of intensity was capable of, so D-classes were requested for live tests. The first test performed was at intensity level 10. However, this resulted in an error message, claiming that the 923 satellite isn't capable of firing at an intensity lower than level 23. In accordance with this new information, the Foundation planned the next test at intensity level 25. This time, the effects immediately took hold. The target and those nearby began to experience a degree of paranoid delusion. They would report hearing voices and be seen interacting with people who weren't there. They would experience a sense of crushing terror, impending doom, and also report the growing desire to cause harm to others. Most of all, in debriefing interviews, they would claim that they felt like they were being watched, though they refused to elaborate on what exactly they meant by that. Recovery time from this condition was measured at being between 15 and 19 days. Next came the test at Intensity Level 35. Everyone affected experienced symptoms similar to Intensity Level 25, except with powerful new self-destructive compulsions. The area of effect also grew with the increased power. Researchers who thought they were safe over 10 meters away collapsed to the ground in intense panic attacks. The effects were much longer on this setting too, and recovery from this intensity took 6 to 8 months. Interestingly, during the test there was a severe disruption to the audio-visual equipment. Some devices had been displaced, others were fused to the ground. The video footage was corrupted beyond use, but the audio retrieved displayed nothing out of the ordinary. However, when survivors of the test were asked to listen to the recorded audio, they claimed to once again hear the voices that were in their head that day and experience the terrible feelings and compulsions start up again. One of the researchers appended a note to the file which read, it looks like this thing actually has a blast effect to it and is not just a laser of madness. The audio and video feed disruptions are particularly interesting. From now on, researchers are to observe remotely, and D-class personnel are to be secured so they can't harm themselves. We need them alive for study. Next, the intensity was brought up to level 50, and the test was conducted once again. The results were once again similar to the previous one, but with far greater intensity and more pronounced physical effects on its victims. D-classes who were completely restrained still exhibited cuts and tears in their skin, and audio-visual recording equipment was displaced to an even greater degree than before. Victims of this intensity have not yet recovered, and Foundation researchers are not confident that they ever will. But the effects went further than just the people present. It appears that the area itself was subject to long-lasting effects. Staff who recovered the D-classes from the testing area reported an extreme sense of unease, claiming that the testing area simply felt wrong but were unable to elaborate further. In spite of this, the tests continued to increase in intensity. Next, the level was increased to 75, and this is when things truly began to go off the rails. The satellite's target was rendered completely comatose, and the D-classes within 16 meters of him broke free from their restraints and began slaughtering each other with their bare hands. Disturbingly, many of the subjects, both living and dead, who were tested after the fact, seemed to bear wounds consistent with attacks by bladed weapons, None of the D-classes were armed, and the wounds seemed impossible to have been caused by mere fingers and teeth. There was an even greater displacement of recording devices, and some were missing after the test. The retrieved recordings caused even worse states of distress for those affected by the blast who were lucky enough to actually survive and could listen to them again. But it didn't end there. Anyone within 50 meters experienced intense panic attacks that often lasted longer than an hour. Observing researchers experienced what could best be described as a slightly more mild version of intensity level 25 symptoms. 
They reported hallucinations, things moving in the corners of their eyes, hearing voices, experiencing heightened paranoia and feelings of dread. There was even some poltergeist activity recorded, with objects seeming to move of their own accord. The lasting effects on the physical area are even more pronounced, with laser rangefinders indicating a level of permanent spatial distortion at the epicenter of the blast site. The researcher appended a note to this section of the file, reading, This is crossing a line from scientific to just barbaric. SCP-923 has said that its maximum output is 238, which it promptly converts to Keter intensity. Let's just see what this does and report our findings. However, the Keter level intensity proved to be too much to handle. So much so, that the entry on its test log begins with the sentence, It is strongly advised that this intensity never be used again. The blast induced psychosis permanently in every subject within a truly insane 2 kilometer radius, including a number of unfortunate researchers who severely underestimated the Keter level blast range. The site is now under permanent foundation protection as SCP-92302. Due to the permanent effects the blast had on the landscape, a sense of panic is still felt from hundreds of meters away, and anyone who gets close enough to the center will experience full-blown psychosis just as much as those directly affected by the beam. Spatial and temporal anomalies abound in the area, and the O5 Council has deemed SCP-923 a risk in causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. But the most frightening part of all is yet to come. Every time the SCP-923 weapon is used, it causes a degree of internal damage to the satellite itself, raising the threshold of intensity that the weapon needs to even activate. It used to be that the satellite would fire at intensity level 23, but after extensive testing, its minimum intensity level is now 66. If the weapon is ever used again, it's only going to get worse. Despite this danger, SCP-923 has been classified as safe. But how is an object that is both out of Foundation control and able to operate with a dangerous degree of autonomy classified the same as harmless anomalies that require little to no containment procedures? The answer is buried in the question. The SCP Foundation cannot contain SCP-923, but seeing as there are currently over 7,500 active satellites orbiting planet Earth, 923 doesn't arouse much suspicion, especially with the Foundation cover story that it's merely a non-anomalous military satellite. The only continued containment effort required is making sure that other satellites do not enter its path of orbit to ensure that 923's advanced defense systems don't activate and destroy the interfering satellite, revealing its anomalous nature. Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, such as SCP-056, A Beautiful Person, or another SCP that'll drive you to do terrible things. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.